right, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's very bright up here, uh, so I can't actually see anything that's happening out there. But um, but appreciate everyone uh, making the time, and, and thank you to our panelists. First, want to say thank you to Vanguard, who is the sponsor of our panel. Uh, we're hoping to be joined by Warren Pennington today, but unfortunately, he had a last-minute conflict. But I'm um, looking forward to the conversation that we're about to have with James and Courtney about recalibrating the cost of capital and really thinking about how uh, investors are thinking about this new wave of technologies and, and how AI is impacting uh, you know, the entire world and what that means from an investment perspective. So um, my name is Sean Dowling. I'm a managing partner with Osage Venture Partners. Uh, we're an early stage B2B software fund based here in, in Philadelphia. Um, and I uh, would love James and Courtney, maybe if you could just start off, give your own personal backgrounds and then a little bit about your fund and your investment strategy and then we can kick off from there. Hi everyone, my name is Courtney Robinson. Um, I am a partner at a firm called Advanced Venture Partners. I am from and now again live here in Philadelphia, um, but spent many years back and forth between San Francisco and New York working in and around tech and finance. Um, and I'm excited to be here with you all today. Uh, our fund is a single LP fund that writes 10 to $25 million first checks in companies with product and market, evidence of product market fit, great founders, big markets, the sort of typical VC spiel. We do both consumer and enterprise investing, typically at the application level, and uh, are very excited to talk to you about what's changed in our world over the last couple of years, both as a result of uh, general markets and interest rates, as well as the uh, sort of step function change in AI processing power. Hi, I'm uh, James Thomason. I'm a managing partner at Next Wave Partners and co-founder of the fund. We're a venture studio um, with an attache or sidecar fund. So we make uh, pre-seed and seed stage investments, 250K to 5 million. Uh, and we're a little bit different than your typical VC because uh, myself or one of the other partners is typically taking on operational roles inside the company. So I'm, I myself am a, uh, a CTO and repeat founder because I'm insane. And uh, I've been doing that for about 25 years. Uh, I live in Silicon Valley. Well, I live north of Napa on an ancient volcano uh, in an area called Lake County, uh, which is one of the least populated areas of California. But it's very, very beautiful and inconvenient to get to. So. Uh, very excited to be here and uh, and talk about the future. Most beautiful places are usually inconvenient to get to. That's how they stay that way, I think. Um, so I think the, uh, the the overall theme for for the conference today is revolutions in progress. Um, and I, you know, I'm sure James, you as an operator, Courtney, you as a, as an investor, myself, we've been talking about AI for a long time. Like, do you think we're in the midst of a revolution uh, or an evolution? And like, what what really has changed over the past? 18 to 24 months um, that, that sparked a, you know, that type of, of name for this conference. James, you want to go first? Sure. So I think um, throughout history, we've seen these incredibly long waves of innovation that are transformative not only to an industry, but to the entire economy and civilization at large. So you can think back uh, to the invention, to the you know, mechanized era, the invention of the cotton gin, automobiles, um, later on, uh, electrification and the, what we went through to deliver electricity to uh, every single business in the country and what, you know, what kind of transformation that had on society. And so I think of AI as one of these long waves of you know, 60 to 75 years where um, technology begets technology and there's a certain kind of determinism that follows with that, right? So as soon as we widely accept a technology, as soon as it becomes part of our, uh, part of our culture, part of our daily lives, we build things on top of it, and then we build things on top of those things, and on and on and on, until that particular technology has sort of diffused all the way through society and maximized its own use. It becomes adopted and used in every single little pocket you know, inside the economy where it makes sense um, economically to do so, in some cases when it doesn't make sense economically to do so. So I think, I think we're in one of those very, very long waves of transformation. I totally agree. I mean, I think to not to state the obvious, but I think the introduction of um, GPT three and four over the past few years have really mainstreamed um, what is possible. And I think we're really just at the tip of the iceberg. I think there's a tremendous amount of 
progress that has compounded over the past few years, and I think it's just going to continue to accelerate. I think there are pockets of real innovation, and I think there are pockets of more of the same. Um, there's a lot of sort of AI fairy dust, if you will, that gets sprinkled onto your average software company. Um, I, I caught up with a, a founder last week who I had met two years before, um, and their company URL is now company.ai instead of company.com. Um, and they talk a lot about AI, and I think part of our job as investors is really to try and sort through what's real and what's not. And for more finance folks like myself, it's great to partner with people like James who really understand things from a technical perspective um, to try and work through what's really differentiated here and what's just more of the same. One of, uh, one of the favorite things I've read recently about uh, that fairy dust of AI, the, the country of Anguilla, which actually owns the .ai extension, the GDP, they, they're collecting more on web hosting fees for, for startups that are now .ai than their GDP was uh, a couple of years ago, which I think is pretty amazing, um, <laughs> amazing stat. So um, I think uh, something does feel different though. I think James, you said we're like in, there's lots of innovation cycles and, and diffusion of technology uh, it sort of goes deep into all sorts of business processes. But you know, ChatGPT launched and had 100 million users within three months, I think it was. Uh, that feels like an accelerated pace of change. Uh, and like, what do you think has unlocked that type of both uh, innovation, but also the zeitgeist? Like, I feel like that's all, you, that's all you can talk about. You can't come to a conference without talking about AI. You can't see a pitch from a, from a, a startup that doesn't talk about their AI, AI capabilities. Is there something different from a technology standpoint that, that you're perceiving, or, or perhaps not? Is that one for me? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so I think the mistake that is easy to make uh, because there's so much hype in tech, you know, in all of our technology adoption cycles, there's always a lot of hype and always a lot of competition, always a lot of startups and frothiness from, you know, VCs pouring capital into these companies. And the truth is, of course, that a lot of them don't make it, um, do not lead to the kind of transformative, they don't dominate the markets that they set out to dominate, and that's just, that's just startup life, right? I think it's easy to make the mistake to look at AI and say, well, this is just another cycle of froth. It's just more grift, you know, more, uh, you know, AI is like blockchain, a whole bunch of noise and like not a lot of real uh, transformative change in the background. So um, I think that's a mistake because um, the way I view AI is more like the introduction of the internet. And I think you know, Krugman famously said, when we look in hindsight at the internet, it'll be no more significant than the fax machine. And clearly that was not correct. Right? The internet changed everything about society. And that's because it was a foundational technology on which other technologies could be built and could integrate with each other. So it's this platforming effect, uh, you know, layer upon layer in the cake where technology advancement is built um, on top of the previous, you know, successive in these successive waves, so I think I think that's an easy mistake to make, and I think um, it's the platform nature of AI as being a foundational technology, and like the ultimate technology, kind of just you know, the ultimate destination of a technology is it just fades into the background. You don't even think about it, and that's how it'll be ten years hence. You'll be in constant contact with AI, and you won't even know it. It'll be doing all kinds of things for you, but it'll just it'll fade into the background like electricity or the internet. You'll never think about it unless it doesn't work. Yeah. And Courtney, in, your, in our prep call, you talked about, so James just compared it to the internet. You compared it to mobile. Like, like what are some of the paradigms that you think through as you're evaluating the impact that AI is going to have on, on the, the landscape? Yeah, I think um, for us, um, I said this during the intro, but we are, we invest at the application layer, not at the infrastructure layer. And so rather than looking at models or sort of chip innovations or anything like that, we're really looking at vertical specific use cases of the technology. Um, we're spending a lot of time right now looking at the potential for AI both within the insurance vertical, the robotics vertical, and life sciences and drug development. Um, I think what's really interesting is there are not only a million places within each of these categories to sort of do use case specific development, but just 
Sean, you, you alluded to this, but the, the business processing um, and the small human tasks that get um, uh, sort of abstracted away based on some of these GPTs in particular are fascinating. Um, I think the other thing that we've been thinking a lot about is where startups can really thrive here relative to some of the bigger players in the space. Um, so OpenAI announced, I think a couple of weeks ago, a partnership with Moderna, right? Um, long term, the idea there is that they'd be really accelerating some of their development. In the short term, it's really about how do you abstract away some of the tasks that scientists have to do so that you make them more productive. I think the question for us as VCs is, you know, is it Facebook with their open source models? Is it um, Google with what they're doing? Is it OpenAI? Or are there really room for um, some of these new businesses to differentiate at the application layer? Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, sort of historically as investors, there's always the, well, what if Google did this? What if Amazon did this question? That feels even more real now as they accrue so much power in their, in their foundational models um, and accrue a lot of data that's really powerful there. Like, James, what's your perspective on where the, where the value is going to accrue in the AI tech stack um, and, and where the opportunities are for investment? Well, I think she's right. I mean, I think the, the best possibility for value to accrue for startup companies is in the specific use cases, the verticalized use cases that are built on top of these foundational models and on top of uh, public cloud. And I think if you, if, for those of you that were around during the, the cloud froth cycle, um, most of the value accrued to the platform companies who had the capital um, to build the infrastructure, right? So, you know, all of the companies that thought that they were going to compete against Amazon or Google or Microsoft, most of them aren't here today. Um, all the companies that thought that they were going to build a private cloud in their own environment and sort of provide the same kind of quality of service um, a public cloud aren't here today. And so I think you have a lot of companies who are, who are chasing that dream of, of building something that is so transformational, so foundational that it allows them to become the next Google or Microsoft. But I think, uh, you know, my skepticism in that is I think that for the most part, these big cloud companies, they, they sort of win by default in the foundational layer of AI. They have the resources, they have the, the skills and engineering and capabilities to, and you know, more importantly, the infrastructure to pull that off. And I just don't see a lot of other companies who, who have any hope uh, of doing that. I think one interesting case is the, um, you know, the open source model, because open source really does give you the ability to, um, you know, to commoditize, you know, to take the, you know, companies like OpenAI are, are leading the curve, they're innovating, right? And open source is behind them commoditizing, they're transforming this progress that OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, others are creating into stuff that's free. <laughs> so I think that, you know, that is an interesting, uh, interesting in the sense that many small companies can take advantage of this commoditized ecosystem that's brought about by open source. But I think all the value is in these highly, just as you said, in these highly verticalized, very specific use cases. Yeah, good. I was just gonna sort of come back to something um, that we were, we were talking about a minute ago, um, about why it's sort of in the zeitgeist now. And I think it sort of relates to some of where the um, where the where the value may accrue, um, I I just think that like tech is so mainstreamed now, and people are excited to try new things in a way that um, just isn't the same as it has been in past cycles. Um, everyone has a phone. Every single person has Instagram on it or Twitter or whatever, and so the the distribution and fragmentation of media and who's talking about this and where people are following. I think it's just, it's exciting, right? And, and humans are excited about the potential here. Um, two other things that I think are interesting about where the value will accrue and are sort of more surface level and mass market sort of conversations around AI. Um, one was around the writer's strike um, in Hollywood last year. Right, just around the 
sort of surfacing of the potential of this technology to both empower creativity um, to accelerate, you know, progress and development of uh, content and also to potentially sort of handicap some of the um, some of the writers and some of the key participants in the ecosystem. Um, and so I think there's a, in addition to the tech part of this conversation, I think there's a really interesting sort of um, sociological part that we'd be remiss not to touch on. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a really good point. Uh, everyone cares, I think, for two reasons that you just highlighted. I think one is it's gonna impact all of us. I think we heard in the last panel, you know, every, at least 80% of jobs, 10% of the work that they do is gonna get impacted by AI at some point. So it's, it's relevant to every, everyone on the planet to some degree. Um, and second, what, to me, what ChatGPT, the real unlock, you know, because they had built LLMs, you know, prior to that, but they created a new user interface that made it accessible to everybody. You know, you can send it to your, you know, to a friend to write a song or help you write your resume or help you, you know, pick out recipes and see what's in your fridge. Um, so, the, like, the accessibility of it is so significant uh, and and makes the the access to that uh, to that technology much more relevant and therefore uh, much more in the in the mainstream. Um, I, I'd be curious to, you know, as you think about this, you know, new evolution of, of, uh, of how technology is getting applied, how does that inform the way that you're making investment decisions? Does that change at all over the last 18 months? And what are the things that you look for as you're evaluating uh, an investment to make? Courtney, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think to a certain extent, given the philosophy of our firm and how we invest and how we're oriented, um, if a company's really performing, like we're gonna get excited about it. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter at this point whether it was um, sort of birthed with an AI first mentality or not. I do think it's going to become increasingly challenging for more legacy businesses that were um, built on um, both technological and cultural infrastructure in a pre-AI era um, to compete to be as capital efficient um, and to, to iterate as quickly um, as it seems like it's going to be going forward. That's my theory. I haven't necessarily seen this play out yet. Um, and I do wonder if, to your point, James, about cycles, um, we're in a bit of a 1999 time frame right now, if you want to compare it to the internet, um, where there's so much excitement, it's clear that the technology is real and will change the way we live and work, but the actual use cases, interfaces, um, economics are not yet at a point where they're going to be mainstream in the next few years. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, we've been thinking about this concept of an AI native company, right? In the same way that now you're cloud native, that makes a huge difference in how you just think about the, the approach to building a business. I think the same is going to be true for AI. What about James? I think you have a sort of deeper technical background. Like, what's your sense as you're evaluating investment opportunities? How much do you focus on the core underlying technology um, and what makes something stand out? Or are you also thinking about more about the, the business use case and the application uh, versus the, the underlying tech? When I had long hair and wore Birkenstocks many years ago, uh, I was all about the technology all the time, right? So if it, if it wasn't a technical topic, I wasn't even interested. And um, I think that what's changed with me, uh, you know, becoming an old man uh, with children and is that I've become more of a human being. And so I'm much more interested these days in the human implications of technology, both in how they uh, improve the quality of life or are detrimental to the quality of life. And so one of the things that's changed for us in our investment thesis is to look uh, not only at, you know, is this a unique widget? Is it technologically differentiated? Does it afford specific competitive advantages? But is this a technology that can have a positive transformational effect to society and the quality of everyone's lives? Because there are many, many use cases of AI which are, um, I'm trying to, try to 
refrain from stating expletives. Many use cases which are um, detrimental to, to health, detrimental to mental health, detrimental to safety. And um, you know, a lot of companies are plowing ahead with those use cases regardless. And a lot of investors are plowing ahead with those use cases regardless. And so we're, we're categorically not. You know, so we're looking for founders that are mindful um, and you know, technologies that are mindful where things like ethics are more than, a, um, more than lip service. They're actually integrated into the design process and into the thought leadership of, of the founders themselves and how they see their company, their product, their technology unfolding in the market. And that's that's a big difference, you know, because I think you know when you're when you're investing in a, uh, you know, a switch company, you know, that makes Ethernet switches for uh, you know, internet infrastructure, you're not really worried so much about like, okay, you know, are the, are the packets flowing through this good packets or bad packets? Are they harmful? You know, because there's no direct, you know, real direct implication of that switch. You know, you can use the switch for a lot of different things. I think AI is categorically different. One of the differences is that you know with and you're talking about the zeitgeist, you know, one of the reasons we're all excited is because we have a machine we can talk to, you know. So it's the first machine that can not only speak to us, but understand uh, human language and a lot of the, the nuance of human language. And language is very integral to our, you know, our being. We're the, we're the only creatures that have it um, on, on the face of the earth. So I think there's also a danger in that. I'm sorry, I'm going on too long, but that's, you know, okay. that's, um, that's a concern for us and something that we look at, you know, right on the surface now. Yeah, no, I mean, I, we, we think about it in a, in a similar way and it's just expanded the scope of, of considerations as you're making an investment. You said, you know, as you said, it used to be about the technology, is that gonna win? Now it's about what's the application, the use case, the business model um, that you're building on top of that technology and also the impact um, that, that a company can have, so. You have to ask, yeah. like, you know, should you build surge pricing for funerals? I'm not sure that's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and how are you treating, how are you thinking about the data, the privacy, um, and uh, a lot of copyright things that, as you were talking about, Courtney. So um, I guess one other just thought process around making investments is the speed at which the potential of generative AI in particular is, is progressing. Is there a fear of obsolescence? Like, has the has the, the time frame shortened uh, for a company to have, have long-term differentiation? What does that mean for the way that you're thinking about uh, the types of companies you're gonna, you're gonna invest in? Who you picks up their mic first? All right, Courtney. Uh, Courtney yeah, I, I, yeah, it's a good question, Sean. Um, I'm not sure it's like really necessarily entered into our consideration set in a real way thus far. Um, I think where it has come up, and we touched on this a bit earlier, is just like the question of will Google do this? Like, again, uh, sort of a lazy VC question historically. Um, I think the power of these models to sort of learn themselves, particularly in sort of specific, specific verticals, is different than it has been in the past. It doesn't require a change in focus. It doesn't require hiring up a huge team. It doesn't require the same level of investment that it has in the past to say, you know, why can't this X company do this? Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a really good question. That might be a good shift to, if that window of opportunity has shortened, like how that impacts uh, the way that we're deploying capital and sort of to get to the specific sort of title of our panel here around recalibrating and rethinking the cost of capital as interest rates have, have increased and that cost of experimentation has changed. Um, how has that influenced the way that you, you think about making investments? Uh, and James, I know you've, you've got some uh, new uh, financial products even that are helping to address this, but I'm curious uh, how, how that cost of capital uh, has impacted the way you invest and, and, the, and the way that you, you engage with, with startups? I'm going to give a very biased viewpoint. Um, I think that one of the things that needs to happen is we need to give up the idea of investing in mythological creatures. Uh, the idea of the unicorn startup, the you know, unicorn investment thesis that is driven by power law returns. And you know, if you listen to a VC talk for five minutes, they're gonna say the word power law usually five times. You know, it comes up at least once a minute. We made, least, it, 20, done, we made it 24 minutes. We've I think done really good. well. Yeah. yeah, we've done really well. Um, when you look at the hard data, 
the fact is that venture capital has underperformed even a passive investment in the NASDAQ for over 20 years. So there's something wrong with that when um, the power law is not only affecting in the distribution of returns, it's also concentrated in just a handful of VC funds. And the paradox is that if you want more unicorn companies, more you know, multi-billion dollar startups, the only way to have them is to make more investments. But you won't make more investments because your preconceived notion of what a unicorn startup looks like uh, doesn't conform to the, co you know, the, the company in front of you doesn't look like that necessarily. But the hard fact is, again, from the data, that you don't actually know. None of us sitting here in this room, none of us certainly in VC land, has any idea what the next unicorn company is going to be. And so, strangely, we've kept the exact same capital financing structure, more or less, in venture capital since the 1970s when it first spun out of PE as an industry. And I think that's silly, right? We need a different way to structure investments in startups so that the founders and the employee teams can reap the rewards more equally of the efforts that they're putting into building these companies, but also the investors who are putting in, especially at the earliest stages, when the level of risk is highest, should have a you know, disproportionate reward, you might say. Um, but it also acknowledges that startups are also a relay race. Right? So the level of capitalization, for example, that my fund can provide is radically different than the level of capitalization that your fund can provide. Right? So there needs to be a way for investors and even founders and employees to get liquidity that isn't locked up and contingent on some distant event you know, that's 10 years in the future, the, the quote exit, you know, that may never in fact happen. So many companies are, are born, they take their products to market, they generate revenue, very healthy revenues for long periods of time, and then at the last moment they crater in the end. Okay, that's, that's an absurd way, in my view, to structure uh, capital financing for startup companies, and it needs to change. Courtney, what's your, uh, what's your thoughts on, on that? Do we still have jobs in a little while, or is James going to take over for us? <laughs> yeah. um, so I think that one of the things that is um, probably market specific right now, but I, I think is very healthy and has changed a lot, is um, given the challenges in the VC market over the past couple of years, there's been um, sort of a coming back around to the idea that you can have a pretty good outcome without being a unicorn. And the realization that raising a round is not an end in and of itself. That's not necessarily a win. Most companies or most founders and employees are not taking any money off the table when that happens. What they're doing is just raising the bar for what they need to do going forward. And so I find over the past couple of years, founders are a lot more open to and having the conversation of like, you know, maybe I'll raise a couple million dollars to get this thing started. I'm gonna try and get to self-sufficiency. And then I'm gonna make the decision based on where the business is, whether I wanna keep growing this thing at, you know, some pace that maybe someday I'll sell it for 50 or 100 million dollars and that will be a life-changing outcome for me and some of my early stage uh, early employees um, but not sort of gorge myself on free capital that's available just because it's sort of what everyone else is doing and so on the one hand you know what I'm saying is not necessarily true in the AI part of the market today. Um, we've forgotten the lessons from 2020 and 21 very quickly. Um, but I, I'm encouraged by some of the commentary around like fitness essentially of companies. Like I think everyone got very fat and happy um, when interest rates were zero and now people are shedding overhead um, and they're getting back in fighting shape and time and time again from both our portfolio companies and those outside of the firm, like they feel better, they're moving faster. Um, anyway, I'm just saying that there are multiple ways to build a business. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think getting back also to the, to the theme around technology, we talk a lot about what's the customer impact of AI, you're building solutions that deliver more customer impact, but at least we're seeing 
the impact might be as transformational on how you build a software company. Like we see AI and, and any company really studies that say somewhere between 30 and 80% improvement in productivity. I mean, that's gonna transform the amount of capital that you need to, to build a business. Um, actually had our first pitch uh, last week where a company in the first half hour shared as a KPI the percentage of their code that was written by AI. Uh, which was like a transformational moment. Like something's gonna, something's different yeah. is gonna be about the resources that are required, which might make think, people think about the capital that they need in a different way. Learn so. to code, they said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that's sort of interesting along those lines is the business model shift, right? So uh, when you're building software that allows a company to have two employees instead of 200, um, the seat model no longer necessarily is applicable, so we've been spending a lot of time internally talking about what that might look like. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I think we're running up on the end of time. Any sort of final thoughts before we turn over to the, to the audience for Q&A? You spoke about efficiency, but that, you know, the previous panel was on the employment market and how, how that was changing, and I think there's an interesting effect, apart from the efficiency and now having KPIs, like how much of your code is AI written, but Part of what the tool does is it sort of takes a not very good person and makes them a pretty good programmer. Um, and it takes a pretty good programmer, or it takes a really good programmer and sort of like homogenizes their skills. So you have this kind of like compression in the spectrum of talent, right? And where you can have more, dare I say, you know, fungible resources, uh, you know, within, within your company. So you might, your criteria for hiring is probably gonna change because you just need someone who's smart enough, good enough, to kind of use the tool, and the tool is going to take care of the really thorny stuff, security issues, performance. You know, it's going to it's going to advise you and actually generate it. Yeah. Good. Well, and I think we have time for a couple questions in the audience. If if we could see you. Um, oh, there you all are. Yeah, there we go. Any any uh, anyone have any questions for the panel? We got one over here. I don't know if we have a mic or something that. I think there's a mic coming so everyone else will be able to hear you too. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Cool. Terrific discussion, really interesting to see how everything's coming together. Make the mic up a little bit, sorry. Uh, there you every, go. Everything's coming together in this sort of platform era and now it's like everything everywhere all at once is what's probably gonna transform. But my question when we talk about it in terms of talent and capital, what about place? Like Philadelphia is Philadelphia. Here we are, we're not in Silicon Valley, we're not in Boston. We can now be anywhere. That's what the other, earlier discussion was about. What do you think in terms of how AI may change where companies come from, where the next, if not unicorn, the next big successful companies, they can now come anywhere? You're the native Philadelphian, so we'll let you answer first. I think that's a great question, and I, I hope that that happens. Um, I hope that we sort of birth a massive company here locally. I think one of the things that's hard to replicate is um, the sort of flywheel of entrepreneurs, the concentration of capital, and really the risk appetite. Um, you know, in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, there's, you know, in seemingly infinite number of angel investors who will cut someone a 25 or 50 or 100K, 500K check after a 30 minute meeting with sort of the expectation that most likely they're not gonna get it back. Um, and so more than the technology, I think it's that ethos um, and that sort of willingness to believe and support the next generation of entrepreneurs that makes it harder to think that, place, that, that these things will come from anywhere. Um, I really hope though that we can sort of have our own exits and unicorns here where some of that flywheel begins to happen. Um, but there's a, there's a social element to it, not just a tech element. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think we certainly have the assets here in Philadelphia. We have the talents, we have the corporations, uh, and we have you know, some great pockets like the uh, cell and gene therapy space that are really taking off here in the city, and um, technology, uh, lots of good examples of companies that are 
that are uh, generating the types of ideas that, that have the potential to maybe not become unicorns, but um, become uh, really transformational businesses. So um, with that, uh, I want to say thank you to, to James and Courtney for, uh, for a great conversation, and I uh, hope that everyone enjoys the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Sean.